So it is time for our first discussion where we talk about relationship uh, between reform pressures which come from the bottom up and those pressures that uh, come from the top down, primarily through the demands of international and European integration process. And it is really my pleasure to say once again to Milena Lazarevic, thank you very much for being here with us. And our second speaker is Gregor Virant. Hello. Hello. Hello, Mr. Wierand. Hi. Can you hear me? Thank you very much for joining us uh, uh, here. And uh, I, I really, I, as a journalist, for me, this is a very interesting topic. And I never before uh, actually think about it, how, how that, th that our government in Western Balkan countries really do not pay such attention to what people in their own country has to say. Milena, how would you describe that? Well, this is a phenomenon that has been uh, researched, studied and uh, proven, let's say, uh, for a number of years, uh, that uh, as the process of European integration uh, and some other international integration processes advance, very often the attention of the government shifts completely mm -hmm. to those international actors and international requirements. And sometimes uh, it uh, comes at the cost of... Um, actually paying attention and being fully uh, accountable and fully responsive to the demands coming from within their own societies. We are today in the 21st, second, uh, in, in the 21st uh, century living in uh, the age of participatory democracy. We cannot uh, uh, speak any longer about only representative democracy and uh, citizens uh, do in, in, a, in a modern democracy have the right and should have the possibility and we heard also from the Montenegrin uh, uh, Minister of Public Administration they need to have the, the possibility to to uh, state their minds, to state their needs uh, also outside of the election uh, sites, outside of the, of, of the elections. Um, yet we have observed that, for example, when uh, legislation and strategies are produced and made by the, by the administrations in our region, that uh, these drafts, when, when they produce draft, uh, produce draft documentation, they are often sent to uh, Brussels, they are sent to Sigma, to other international actors, but uh, in some cases, uh, uh, proper public consultation processes don't happen. And what is more, uh, let's say, even more problematic, I would say, that in addition to uh, uh, not sometimes not organizing public consultation processes and engaging, involving the public, the civil society, uh, all the interested, interested parties, the private sector as well, uh, in the process of developing uh, policies and legislation, in many cases, even when those consultations are organized, they are done in a very formalistic way. And uh, in many cases, still, uh, the public does not get proper reports, does not get proper information mm -hmm. about, uh, um, you know, how their feedback and how their inputs in those consultation processes have been tackled. Mm -hmm. Now, this being said, I have to say that, you know, there have been some examples of good practice in the region and there have been reform champions, which in our work of the Weber uh, uh, project, we have also tried to identify and always you know, promote these examples of good practice and champions of reform, as we call them. Uh, but unfortunately, these are not yet systematic, uh, systemic processes. These are not yet systemic practices. And very often when people change in the, those institutions, uh, practices uh, change as well, and some of in the good practices, way? some of the good practices disappear. If people mm -hmm. who were eager and willing, for example, you know, now in Montenegro they have this uh, very uh, young and very eager enthusiastic, minister, enthusiastic yes. minister of public administration who is coming with so much uh, knowledge and so much experience to share and to try to to, to commit to her to her home country. But you know, s when these people leave, you know, when when these people are changed, then things go back, and these good practices very very often don't don't get institutionalized. And this is why it is so important to speak about institutionalizing practices. And this is why I think that, you know, the work that we in the civil society are doing and the work that Sigma is doing is extremely important. Yeah. Now, Mr. Viran, what, uh, what do you say about this uh, issue, uh, which is, I must say, it's almost uh, every country uh, has here in the Western Balkan as a problem. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. And uh, hello to everyone. Uh, likewise to Miriam, I would very much prefer to be, with, to be together with you in person in Belgrade, but uh, this is how it is. Uh, let's hope that, that we will soon have an opportunity for that. Look, um, for, for every reform in every country, uh, there needs to be political power behind. That there needs to be political will, there needs to be political commitment. And in the Western Balkans, election battles are fought on 
emotional issues, not on rational ones. And the politicians in, 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 in general, I, I can say, but in the West, in Western Balkans particularly, are masters of managing people's emotions and sometimes manipulating people's emotions. So, of course, there are exceptions. I mean, uh, I cannot say how much I am rooting for young idealistic uh, politicians such as uh, uh, Tamara Serzentich that we, we uh, just heard. This is, you know, she's bringing a different, a totally different uh, world. This is something uh, new. And let's really, really keep our fingers crossed that uh, she is successful. Now, uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you think about your own country, each one uh, of the participants today, of, of, the, of the colleagues in the audience, there is some emotional issue around which, at the end of the day, uh, uh, is uh, the, the, the political battles are, are fought. And, you know, in this sense, um, I would not overestimate this bottom-up pressure in the area where, in all the areas where there is no interest of the ruling uh, political elites. Um, on the other hand, um, it's obvious that governments like to please the citizens, in as many ways as possible and to show concrete results because it co-creates the general attitude of the nation towards the government. Even, you know, even in, in the world's uh, most authoritarian regimes, <laughs> you know, the rulers uh, uh, try to please uh, the, uh, the citizens, even if they are not voters. Um, there is also some sort of enlightenment. There are definitely are good intentions to do good things in, across uh, uh, the region, in the governments. And this is reflected in good progress in certain areas, such as digitalization and service delivery, you know, where some of the countries in the, of the Western Balkans rank relatively well in, in, in global uh, um, terms. And these are the areas, of course, where the, the political elites cannot really lose anything. Um, and they are definitely important, and we should not be cynical about that. The government should be commended, and the citizens recognize it. Uh, also, we will see later that, that uh, Weber's uh, monitoring shows it. But there are other areas where political will is obviously lacking. Um, areas which are in the core interest of the political elite, and sort of blind spots for, for, for the politicians like improving democracy, uh, checks and balances, independent oversight institutions, media freedom, uh, monopoly abuse, uh, corruption, uh, politicization of public administration, uh, stakeholder engagement in policy making, quality of policy making processes. Uh, Mr. Virant, how do you explain that? It is interesting, really, because all those that you have said, it is very crucial for one country, for one society. So how do you explain that, that uh, those are black spots for the government? As I said at the beginning, because the, the, battle, the political ba battleground is unfortunately uh, most often elsewhere. You know, it is in one of these big emotional, sometimes historical issues that are so typical for the Balkans. But, you know, the things that I have just mentioned are, mentioned are extremely important because they make the difference. They lead to success and prosperity of a country. Uh, and this is what makes the difference between, I don't know, Ireland or Finland on the one hand or, or Netherlands or, or other successful countries and some less successful countries on the, uh, um, on the other side. Now, um, in a way, you know, to, to, to some extent, uh, the, the, deep down, the people understand it and know that. You know, if you look at the, um, the latest Ipsos uh, uh, survey, um, when, when, the, the, when people were asked what is the main reason for this dissatisfaction with the EU accession uh, progress, the answer was poor situation in institutions, inadequate laws, corruption. So in broad terms, they understand it. But, you know, when it comes to details, unfortunately, politicians can always outsmart and manipulate. So, in this respect, I think that the role of NGOs is extremely important in the sense of uh, educating, uh, enlightening, and explaining to the people what actually all this, good governance, good institutions, 
what it means in details. Mm -hmm. How much? I, yes. I, I, yes. Mm -hmm. On what Gregor mm -hmm. has just uh, said. Um, uh, indeed, it is the role of the civil society on the one hand to uh, monitor and to, to let's say, uh, scrutinize uh, these governmental policies which are related to everything that, that Gregor has just mentioned. Um, and it is also to educate and to, to, to promote it with uh, the citizens. And I think that, you know, the civil society in our region is really already doing that. Where we come into a problem, and this is somehow, this hits at the core of our discussion today uh, about how we can have a better um, let's say, um, uh, better uh, interplay of these top-down and bottom-up conditionalities. Uh, the point is that we need to come out of the situation where it appears that the European Union is communicating one thing and that uh, the, the domestic civil society is communicating Another a different thing. thing. Yeah. Now, it, this is not up to Sigma. This is not up even to the European Commission because we can see that, you know, both Sigma reports and uh, both the European Commission reports are uh, quite um, uh, to the point. They're very factual and they've very clearly state uh, what are the problems uh, in the areas. For example, the last European Commission's report in 2020 even called out on the Serbian government openly for breaching its own legislation on civil service whereby uh, the acting managers and acting directors were still being um, um, uh, appointed against the law, in breach of the law, at the time when this law was already being implemented. It is a big deal for an international organization to, to call out on a, on a national government that way. But, but then what happens is that when the commissioner comes and when high-level um, uh, political leaders come, not only from the EU institutions, but also from, um, from uh, various EU member states, then somehow these messages disappear. And these messages are not clearly heard, and there is always this explanation that it is because you know it is diplomacy, and you know uh, uh, leaders uh, cannot uh, communicate in this from way. Disappear from dialogue between them and government, or between them and uh, and civil society. It, it disappears from the public dialogue in general. Uh -huh. So you cannot hear it in the public statements. You cannot hear it in the media. Uh, we have often spoken to p political leaders, and well, not maybe so much political leaders, but decision and policy makers in various EU member states, and also in Brussels, and they always say that yeah, but you know, these messages are communicated behind closed doors. But what is the problem that happens uh, here on the ground in our countries uh, when there is this dissonance between what is stated in our reports and in the reports of the European Commission and Sigma and the high level messages? What happens as a result of this dissonance is that people only hear what is commended. People, ordinary citizens, don't go and read Sigma's reports. They don't yeah. go and read the uh, European Commission's reports. They follow press, uh, press statements. And if the media, if the journalists do not have the way, the possibility, to clearly communicate and to clearly hear these statements and communicate, and, and as, as the, the transfers of, of the message, communicate that to the public, then it appears that you know, we are the bigger, bigger Catholics uh, than the Pope, that we are uh, the ones demanding things which are not demanding by the European Union, and that, that the EU is actually saying that you know, things are much better than we are saying ourselves. Whereas in, in effect, when you compare the, res the results and reports of our monitoring, the Weber monitoring, and the monitoring from Sigma and the European Commission, you will find that in many areas where we are following uh, similar issues, our findings are very similar. Mm -hmm. So this is where we need to really uh, uh, be very uh, careful and very, I would say, creative in the coming years to make sure that these messages are clearly communicated because when we ask the people, the people also see those problems. The people also feel those problems. In our public perception survey that we did within our Weber research, uh, over 60% of citizens uh, in a representative survey, so this is really mm -hmm. something that, uh, let's say, pictures, paints the picture of the entire Western Balkans, over 60% of citizens across the region think that it is necessary to have a political or personal connection to get a job in public administration. This is how citizens see the situation. So they don't see it rosy. But when they constantly get messages... But you messages, also put that in your report and exactly. you can also find that in the European Commission report. Exactly. Yeah, Absolutely. And it Absolutely. is in... They, all countries have that in, in common as, as a problem. Yes, indeed. Yeah. But Mr. Virant, uh, you have mentioned that uh, things can... Uh, when we talk about the European Union, Union. How much these uh, comments are related to uh, European integration? Because uh, uh, it is uh, it is goal for uh, let's say Serbia, but also for other country in Western Balkan. Yeah. Uh, well, to put it in the context, uh, recent polls show that there is still a very very uh, strong, overwhelming support for uh, for EU membership in all. Uh, Western Balkans countries, uh, 
it's, it's in the range from 64 in Serbia to 95, I guess it's, it, it, it could be Kosovo. Uh, and the average is 82%. So overwhelming, overwhelmingly, uh, the people understand uh, the advantages of becoming a member of the European Union. On the other hand, there is less optimism on the prospects of getting there. Um, in some of the countries, it is, uh, um, it's slightly better. In Montenegro, for instance, 50% of, of uh, the citizens believe that, um, that full membership in the European Union of the country is possible within five years. So that's very optimistic. On the other hand, you have in Serbia one-third of the population who don't even believe that this will ever happen, ever. So there's, a, there's, there's a, some kind of apathy, which reminds me of a, of a verse from the, from the late uh, Georgia Balashevic, um, who said something like, uh, I think it's in one of his songs, uh, he says, Putui uh, Evropo, nemoj više čekati na nas, or something like that. So, um, move on Europe and don't wait for us anymore. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, apathy. Um, now, uh, see, this overwhelming support for EU integration, I think, is a, is a huge impetus for, for reforms in, in many areas. Uh, this is extremely, extremely important. Uh, it's important because people expect from their governments to do things in the direction of meeting uh, the expectations of, of the European Union, uh, meeting the transposing the, uh, the, the uh, key, uh, meeting the standards and the requirements for membership. Um, why does it matter so much? Because as opposed to the, to the regional politics, you know, EU institutions are much more rational. As Miriam said before, you know, it's not ideal in the EU member states. We all know it. And there are huge differences also in the EU member states. And there has been setback in some of the member states after accession, also in the area, area of public governance, rule of law, and so on. We have, we have heated debates in the European Union on, on this issue. So it's far from a perfect, far from a perfect union. Uh, but however, it is much more rational, mm -hmm. reflects the, let's say, the advanced views on public governance that prevail in the member states, especially in the, in the, yeah, in the more advanced ones, like... like um, uh, Ireland or, or, or Sweden or, or Finland, Nordic countries, and so on. Um, and uh, uh, as a result, of course, and this is a logical result, European Union in its enlargement strategy emphasizes, as Miriam also highlighted today uh, uh, very clearly, that public governance or public administration reform is one of the fundamentals. And so is the rule of law and some other um, areas which... Uh, which uh, are not net where not necessarily the political commitment really uh, exists. Yeah, definitely. Did you uh, did you notice, Milena, that uh, those reforms that are related to European uh, standards are moving faster than the others, and that civil society has a, a bigger role in that? Well, I would say that, you know, mm -hmm. by now, uh, almost all reforms are related to European integration. Mm -hmm. I think that for public administration reform, which is our topic today for quite a long mm -hmm. time, it was not clear that it was uh, uh, one of the key requirements uh, in the process of EU integration. Now, uh, well, already with the previous strategy, but especially now with the new methodology for uh, EU accession, public administration reform has been put on the same footing with rule of law. And it is clear that these are the fundamental reforms. So it, uh, the public administration reform was already a fundamental area. But for example, you could open uh, accession negotiations without having a specific action plan on a or a roadmap uh, for public administration reform. Now, for, Macedo for North Macedonia and Albania to start their accession negotiations according to the new methodology, they need to have these roadmaps or uh, action plans also for public administration reform. So now we can speak uh, about really a, a full realization that public administration reform is as important as the reform of judiciary and uh, in independent uh, judiciary. Why? Because this is the, the 
the, the area which governs the very basic functioning of the institutions uh, which, which uh, govern uh, a country. But I just wanted to come back to one thing which, uh, which uh, Gregor also sp spoke about and which is related to you know, this situation that the EU uh, finds itself now that some of its member states are, have backs have started to backslide on some areas of rule of law, but also public administration reform. And this happened after they joined the European Union. Uh, this is precisely this experience from Central and Eastern European uh, countries is precisely uh, what goes into the rationale of, our, of, of the work we are doing. We have realized that once you become a new member state, and we still honestly yeah, hope that, that we will all get yeah. there, uh, that these external external impetuses and external conditionalities, these top-down conditionalities, they either disappear or they get softer. The EU does not have as strong mechanisms to condition the, its own member states on these fundamental areas, at least not yet. They're working to get there, but still not yet. Not as much as in uh, uh, various uh, economic integration and market-related uh, mechanisms. But in the, in the process of accession, it can ask more. And this is why it is asking more. But what happens once we get into the European Union? What, what happens once uh, Sigma uh, is no longer there as an external uh, contributor and as an external actor to be monitoring our administrations? If we don't build in the meantime, and this is the meantime, we're living yeah. the meantime right now, if we don't build these bottom-up pressures, these uh, capacities and mechanisms within our civil society, which is going to hopefully stay there once we get into the we EU as well. We will have a problem when we uh, really... Exactly. Exactly. So we will state. be able to continue pressurizing, monitoring mm -hmm. the governments, doing a similar work that Sigma is doing now. What we're doing actually through the Weber project is that we are emulating, we're kind of doing what Sigma is doing in a slightly different way, but we are learning how to monitor our governments in, a, in an evidence-based way, not to act politically and say, we don't like this, we don't like that, yeah. but to show data, to, to be able to say, according to this data, according to the opinions of the citizens, according to the opinions of your own civil servants, you're not doing the right job. Are we too late or we have still a time? I, I, I think we still have time because mm -hmm. the process of integration is unfortunately not going as fast as we would like it to go. But I think we, we are on a good track. We're already mm -hmm. now in the fifth year of implementing this Weber initiative. We are working with more and more civil society organizations across the region to get... To is get, that uh, also key for, uh, for uh, this pressure from uh, bottom-up uh, to have a relation with uh, other countries, uh, to, to put, you know, like... Uh, to, together we are stronger. Absolutely. On the one hand, it, it is this logic, together we are stronger. We are sharing a lot of experiences and know-how uh, between the organizations in the region. We have a, a regional platform, mm -hmm. a Weber platform, in which we're gathering 22 organizations from the region which are working on public administration reform. Uh, but also, it is important to work on the regional level in order to uh, be able to benchmark countries. And our monitoring, the work that, that we are doing and the results of which are going to be presented in the next session, is fully regionally comparative. So we can benchmark countries against each other. And you know, sometimes you get uh, very uh, strange questions like, oh, how is it possible that, you know, this uh, situation in this country is better than a situation in that country when I don't know what. Mm -hmm. So governments sometimes and institutions, they get a little bit, you know, angry or they get a little bit offended. But you those know? are facts. Those are facts. <laughs> but on the other hand, also, I think that this from time to time also stimulates positive peer pressure and positive uh, competition between the governments. This is also why, you know, our politicians are also even now saying uh, here in Serbia that it would be good for Serbia for uh, if Mac North Macedonia and Albania start accession negotiations. Bef because the more countries we have in the process, the better for everybody. Because then th there will be also more pressure between the countries to, uh, to, to make progress. Yeah, Mr. Virant, uh, now when we uh, see what is, uh, what are problem, what problems are, what would you say how to resolve that in some uh, real time period, not short time period, but some real time period that uh, really all, um, all countries in Western Balkans are satisfied and that we put really citizens first? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I would say that um, although it's, it's, it's normal that, that the expectations are high, uh, we must consider this uh, as, a, as a marathon. Um, things cannot happen overnight. Things are improving, uh, although sometimes uh, um, these are really only baby steps. Um, you know, often in, uh, in thinking and uh, discussing about reforms, we overestimate what can be done in one year or two years or three years, but we usually underestimate what can be done, what can be done across 10 years. 
So if you look at, 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 at the countries of the Western Balkans 10 years ago and today, there have been improvements. I think there's no doubt that there have been improvements and citizen, citizens also recognize them. Um, and, you know, even uh, the citizens of the EU member states, do you think that we are fully satisfied with, with the performance of our countries, our, our gov governments? We are not. We are not. As you know, I come from, from uh, Slovenia, which is one of the, uh, let's say, uh, was always known as, as one of the um, best performing candidate countries, is uh, probably still one of the best performing new member states. Um, so somewhere around the average of the of the EU, but but you know we would like to be closer to uh, to Finland or Ireland. So it it does it does take time. Uh, however, I think and let me end with this: um, it's so important to really to understand the the relevance of of public governance, rule of law, and strong institutions. I remember from the speech of, of, of Hata, this was very, very inspiring for, for me, and I really listened very carefully. She said, you know, she said something like, uh, what do I do when the system becomes my obstacle? You know, when the system itself becomes the obstacle. You know, she's hardworking, she's, she's smart, she's talented, she's bright. But, you know, she, her only problem was that she was born in a country where the government does not perform as well as, as in some other countries. So this is something that has to be, you know, told, told over and over and over again, how much public governance really matters. Thank you. Thank uh, you. And Milana, yeah, I what would, would you say, uh, what is, uh, let's say, a real time period that we really have that um, on the ground to feel it that uh, citizens comes first? <laughs> this entirely depends on the political uh, on the political elites uh, in the region. We can see, uh, luckily, that in some areas, uh, as Gregor also mentioned, uh, uh, more has been done, especially uh, after the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, uh, most of the governments in the region have done a lot to improve uh, service delivery mm -hmm. and to improve on uh, electronic services. We will also hear now in the breakout sessions some good examples uh, about uh, uh, this provision of new uh, and more citizen centers. Yeah, but they uh, had uh, to. services but yeah, they, they had, had to, to exactly yeah. so we cannot we cannot artificially create this uh, mm -hmm. this uh, alarming situation yeah. that you need to respond and you need to create a more account be like normal situation. Exactly, and. exactly. So in that sense, I think that, you know, if the governments, if the political leaders in the region hear young people such as Hata, and I think, you know, this was a very powerful message that she gave, yeah. you, you know, it is, do not blame young people for leaving. Make us want to stay. It's not mm -hmm. your job to make us stay in the region. It's your job to make us want to stay here. And in order to want to stay here, we need to have the feeling that we can be judged according to our own merit. If you're constantly promoting uh, party patronage, uh, clientelism, uh, nepotism in the recruitment, in the promotion, in the in the, in, in the public sector. You're giving, uh, you, you're, you're taking away hope from the young people, and this is why they're leaving. So this is what needs to stop, and this is why political leaders in the region have to hear young people such as Hata. Definitely, Mr. Virant, uh, I would like to thank you. Maybe you will have something to add, uh, like some uh, some rec uh, recommendation. Um, well, uh, my recommendation for the for the NGOs that are uh, joined in this uh, Weber project uh, would be just uh, uh, carry on. It's an important project. Uh, look over the shoulders of your uh, governments uh, and require uh, more and more better services, uh, better functioning of institutions. Uh, um, more credibility of the institutions and uh, do as much as you can to tell this story to the citizens uh, and to make them understand uh, how much um, good, high quality, uh, trustworthy institutions uh, and good governance uh, really matter. Mr. Rierant and Milan, a last question for you. What do you see as the first big test for government in the uh, our region regarding to put citizen first? I think that the, the, the first big test will be whether, uh, you know, this uh, COVID-19 crisis is going to result only in improved uh, services 
uh, or it is, is it going to result also in improved transparency, improved responsiveness and accountability of the governments, and if these institutions, institutions are really going to perform their jobs, if the governments are going to be more, uh, more uh, transparent in their reporting, in their decision making, if we're going to get information about various public procurements related to the crisis, this is going to be you know, the first real test. Once we're out of the crisis mode, and I think you know, soon we will be out of the crisis mode, whether the, the quality of the government in our region is going to be uh, uh, worse or better uh, than it was before. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting discussion. Before we uh, start, uh, start on uh, to continue, we have um, uh, something to say to our Zoom audience. Uh, just a, as a reminder, in the case you leave the event at any time, you can also come back uh, by using the same link. Also, this uh, same link should be used for assessing the conference tomorrow. And now we will have a presentation of the Western Balkan Power Monitor. Uh, Power Monitor will be presented by Milos Djindjic. He is Weber Leader Serger and Program Manager of European Center Policy Belgrade. And Juliana Karaj, she is Senior Researcher at the European Policy Center from Skopje.